Thanks for tuning in today. I'm John Holmes, this is the Suron B, and this is my beard. So I figured it was about time to do another update on the Suron B or Light B or whatever the name is these days, MX, I don't even know. I'm just riding it, having fun. But it has been over a year and a half since I got this thing. And unfortunately, I didn't put a lot of miles on it in the past six months because I broke my leg. But now I can, I can bend my leg enough. Look at, look at that. I can bend my leg enough to, to get on the bike again. So I've been riding it. And you don't really appreciate something until you can't have it for a while. And to tell you the truth, not riding this for a while hopping on my uh, 50cc bikes first because I could actually get on them and then hopping on this guy really made me appreciate how good this bike is. Now it hasn't all been roses over the past year and a half, but I still really love the bike. So let's just go through the things that I talked about that I thought would have problems and the problems that I did have and then of course what I really love about the bike. So the first thing that I probably uh, had mentioned, I know I mentioned it in the original video, was that I was concerned about the front hub. I was concerned that we would have issues with the front hub stress cracking over time uh, because it's 12 gauge spokes and uh, just a normal flange width. I think it's uh, about a two and a half millimeter flange width, 2.6 millimeter flange width. And a few factors have contributed to this actually being a really solid front wheel over time. I've jumped this thing downstairs. I've done things that I probably shouldn't be doing with this bike and I've had zero problems with it. So my thoughts on the matter are that the spokes are long enough, being 12 gauge, that they have enough stretch because the longer the spoke is, the more stretch they get. The wheels that I had problems with that I built with that style hub flange and 12 gauge spokes had uh, shorter spokes because they were 16 and 17 inch wheels. These are 19, so we get more stretch in the spokes. That's good for the hub. The other difference, I believe, as compared to the ones that I built and had problems with, is that this is a forged hub and not simply a machined hub. It is more expensive to forge a hub and then machine your final little contours on the outside than it is to simply machine the hub from a billet. And that contributes to a much, much stronger hub flange. All of the more expensive hubs in the world are forged. And the way that this one looks, I would assume that it is forged as well. Now, without talking to the factory, I don't really know, but that is an assumption that I have for the reason that we have no problems with the front hub. So hey, that's, that's super, super good for a bike. You don't want the front wheel falling apart on you. That's like the worst thing that could ever happen. Now I did end up having trouble with the forks that came with the bike. So these are some aftermarket ones that I slapped on. I had laying around uh, Boxer World Cups from Rock Shocks. I think these are 2010 model, pretty old ones. Uh, so the original fork that I had was the Air Sprung and I, man, I don't even remember the brand. It's been so long since I looked at that sucker. But the problem was that we had air going from the bottom chamber to the top chamber, and it was constantly losing pressure that way. So the fork would jack down lower and lower and lower, and I would lose my compression rate. The factory actually changed this right after my bike was, you know, my, my, this is the first version. The second version bike that came out, which was just literally months after I bought mine, they did not offer the air sprung fork. The, uh, the, motorcycle style fork that came with it was actually a coil sprung from that point on and then they started offering them with a more mountain bike style i don't even know if it's air sprung or coil sprung but i haven't heard of anybody uh, having any problems with the new dmr forks that are also available on there so like i've said before the factory has addressed all of the problems that they have had and uh, just made it better as time goes on. And they, they haven't waited until a year rolls around. They've been doing it every single release, every single time they make this bike in a batch, they have essentially just made every problem go away, which is super awesome. I, I couldn't ask for anything better out of an American-based company, much less a Chinese-based company. So again, two thumbs up, even though I had to replace my fork and LunaCycle offered to send me a replacement fork, but I decided to just use one that I had laying around that was doing nothing for me on the shelf and is a little bit lighter, et cetera, et cetera. Don't really need to go into the details of why I didn't take them up on the warranty offer, but I didn't, but they were there to support me when it mattered. Another issue that I did have was that the charger kind of failed. It didn't really fully fail, but it had a component smoke on the inside. You can look at the video in our uh, you know previous video list about that. But again, LunaCycle was there for me. They replaced that sucker as quickly as they possibly could, which was awesome. And the new charger is even better than the original charger. And now since I uh, had a charger 
from ebikes.ca. Now I have two chargers. I leave one at home, I leave one at work, and I also have two battery packs so I can just switch and swap and do whatever I feel like and it works out great. Uh, so how about batteries? So I got the bike originally with a battery that was super low, like so dead that it, it wouldn't even come on when you push the little button on top. And I had concerns about the range on that. I ended up buying a second battery from them, which was also the version two battery. And I have learned a few things about these batteries. Number one, the battery was so low that I thought that there may be a problem with it. Zero problems with it. The BMS on these and the batteries on these are just good. When it boils down to it, it knows when to shut off. If it's just been sitting for so long, it knows to go into a state to where it doesn't even harm the battery. And uh, I thought that maybe there'd be a problem with it. Zero problem. I have no range difference between my original battery and my new battery. But I do have one difference, and that is when the old battery, when the version one battery sits for extended periods of time, like six months, it'll discharge just a little bit. Uh, so. Uh, man, I, I forget off the, off the top of my head. It was like a 20% discharge rate, if I do recall correctly. I've talked about it in a previous vid, uh, but it discharged over six months, maybe 20% sitting there, which by itself is actually really great for a battery that has an onboard BMS system. However, the new batteries that they have has an even better BMS system. Like, what have they done? They've made what is already great even better. And the new battery, I believe this is the new battery. Let's take a look here. Yeah, I can actually tell because the little screen uh, is a little bit easier to read on the new version. Maybe you can see it's kind of kind of hard. You press that button and you get the little capacity thing on there. It shows you how much capacity. It's kind of an average capacity on there. Uh, but the new battery over six months, it didn't discharge any more than 7% on me. I mean, that's more than twice as good, almost three times as less of a discharge rate just sitting on the shelf. Uh, so with the new battery, man, I think it could sit for years without damage, which that's unheard of in the market so far. I've never, ever had a battery with a BMS built in that would go that long and discharge so little. So they, they've just made it better. While I'm talking about the battery, I, I was skeptical about the little percentage deal on the battery being anything of, uh, of an indicator of how much state of charge I had left. But I have found that it is close enough for me to use. So the other day I forgot to throw in a fresh battery. I forgot to charge my bike and I had to ride about five miles one way and five miles back and i was like man i don't know like that that's about a third of the total range on the bike pressed a little indicator it told me i had 60 percent left and so i assumed it's like well i'm probably gonna have like 40 35 percent when i get back if this thing is correct and what do you know when i got back to my shop it was exactly at 40 percent so it has been a lot more accurate on that battery indicator than I thought it would be, which is great because now I don't have to get a secondary, you know, cycle analyst to show how many amps I have used, how many amp hours I've used. And, uh, you know, just less clutter on the bike and less things that I have to worry about being able to rely on that. Let's see, what else do we have here? The fork, the battery, the brakes. So the one issue that I did have that I did not expect on the original bike was that the brakes uh, how to describe this. The pad compound was too soft. I wore through both the front and the rear brake pads in less than 200 miles for sure. And that, come to find out, that was a first run issue. With the second run, they had harder brake pads on there and the brake pads, hey, guess what? I have a second run brake pad on there now. And I've been rocking it for almost a thousand miles on the rear only. I took off the front brake. Uh, when I was changing out the forks, I got lazy and just snipped the old cable in half because I, I don't, I don't know. I don't care, whatever, my bike, right? But uh, now the brake pads work great. The only issue that I have had is that I've, I've had trouble bleeding the brakes properly. Uh, maybe there's a bleed on the bottom and I just haven't done enough work to find it. So I've been top bleeding the brakes and there's still a little bit of air trapped in the lines. So it would probably be a good idea for me to re-bleed those uh, because they do rub a little bit. When you have air in the lines, the brake pads can't always pop out fully and sometimes they'll rub super small complaint on that. That's really my laziness than over anything else, but they're compatible with normal, uh, you know, mountain bike style disc brakes. So I could always throw some hopes on there or any other brand and uh, do whatever I please. So it hadn't been a, a bad issue, but the brakes were an issue. Luna, Luna cycle stepped in, took care of it. No big deal. The tires. So these are super grippy, soft tires. I'm not the biggest dude, uh, 160 when I'm heavy. Uh, 150, 148 when I'm light. 
and I have ridden these tires for over a thousand miles on the pavement and I don't treat them nicely and they still have plenty of tread left. I expect these things to be worn out in 500 miles to tell you the truth because they're so soft. Now let's get a shot of the rear tire here uh, to see. Now this is me braking like a hooligan and just pinning the throttle constantly. I, I ride this as hard as it will allow me to ride it and we still have plenty of tread left. I would estimate that I'm going to get about 1,500 miles, maybe 2,000 miles. Sorry for you metric folks, uh, I don't know the exact conversion, but uh, extremely pleased with these tires. I hope I can get more of them because they're actually lighter than the Shinko 244s or 241s that I would normally rock. Uh, and I really like the lightweight of the wheels, it, it creates a very snappy feel. And I also like the tread pattern and the tread profile, the roundness of this is really confidence inspiring, even on the street, leaning over hard. Uh, I have, I have never felt that, uh, you know, and, and I don't really get off of these nubs when I'm leaning. I don't get all the way over to the side nubs, obviously on the street, but there's still just, just the perfect profile roundness. I feel, uh, it, it just is super predictable. I love the tires. What can, what else can I say about them? Uh, let's see, uh, re gear on here. This is probably the final point that I'll, uh, have to lead out with is I did re-gear the rear. I put a larger sprocket on it. Uh, let's see what we got on here. Can I see what it is? It's, uh, it's hidden. Where, whatever the tooth count is, it is hidden, but it is 20% larger than the stock sprocket. And this gives me 20% more torque, but 20% less top speed. And since I mostly use it on the street, that puts me right about 35-ish miles an hour or something like that. And it, uh, it ends up being just perfect for riding around, uh, at least on the street for myself. Uh, and even off-road, I, I don't need, I don't need 45 miles an hour. Let's just be real with it. I, I don't need that much speed. So for me, the lower gearing is great. Now there is a downside to it on an electric vehicle. When you gear down, you may actually lose some power. You may lose that mid-range snap. And I definitely feel that this bike, you know, it gained, uh, you know, wheeling, basically. It gained that 20% torque off a line. But once it gets past, eh, like 10, 15 miles an hour, I feel like it starts falling flat. And I almost would need to draw a graph for you to explain why this occurs. But essentially, we're just not loading down the motor enough. So the motor's like, well, if you're not gonna ask for 5,000 watts, I'm not gonna give you 5,000 watts. That's the way that electric motors work. So when I'm in mid throttle, it's already past the point of our phase amp limiting and our battery amp limiting. And it's just rocking whatever the motor is being asked of, which is less than when a motor is geared taller. And so it feels, it feels weaker in the mid range for sure. And uh, the way to get around this though, is with electric motors, you always got ups and downs. Uh, so gearing it slower and kind of losing my mid range throttle punch, I could actually get a controller with more amp draw on the phase side and that would help. And if I got an FOC controller, which the, the X comes with, the, the Suron X, whatever they call MXX or Light BX or whatever the name is on that guy, uh, it has a field oriented controller, which allows for phase amp, uh, let's see, what do they call it? Uh, they, they, it? It's essentially like timing advance. But with a FOC controller, the way that you inject the timing advances with an exact amount of amperage on the phase. And uh, well, it's just slipping my mind right now, but uh, phase amp injection is essentially what it is. And you can control exactly how much heat you put into the motor with this. And you can also accelerate the motor on the top end. So let's say that the, the motor's topping out at like 8,000 RPM and I've geared down and I want that 20% back. Well, essentially we can inject a certain amount of additional phase amps uh, phase amp weakening. There we go. Uh, that's what it's called. Uh, so you inject a certain amount and we know based on the motor parameters, like if we want 20%, I, I personally don't know, but uh, once you test and tune with it, you can say, well, I want 20% more speed. This amount of phase amps is going to give me that additional speed. It's just like timing advance, but a much more controlled way of doing it. Then you can get your top speed back. You also gain your 20% additional torque on the low end. And then the mid range throttle ends up feeling more snappy on top of it you get 20% uh, more torque on your mid range and you get the additional phase amp weakening that gives you that, that hard slap, that, you know, that extra punch along with the extra top end speed. I have not changed out the controller yet to an X controller. Well, it's another 800 bucks or whatever it is right now, 600 bucks. I don't even remember because it's not on my radar for a purchase today. 
it almost makes people just want to buy an X, but who needs two bikes? Not me. As much as I'd love to have another bike, I don't need two of these guys. All my friends tell me that I do because they want to go riding with me, of course, every single one. Yeah, you need another bike. You definitely need another bike. So I'm really trying to not buy another bike right now. And I feel like getting an X controller on this guy would like kind of satisfy the need. I'd get everything that I want. But there's really nothing else that I that I need on this bike, and it's more of just like a frivolous, like, yeah, sure, I could use my speed back. But what I would probably do is uh, gear it down even further, and then reduce my top speed, get 40% more torque off the line, and you know, just chasing the cat's tail or the dog chasing the cat or whatever that old saying is. That's uh, that's none of my business. That is none of my business. So, what I would like to know from you guys is who else has one of these long term and have you noticed any other problems with it or any other things that you really love? I love the way that it handles. I love the capacity of it. Honestly, 30 miles of range for me is plenty. I live two miles away from my shop. The hobby house is one mile in between. So if this thing ran out and I'm going from work to home, I'm never gonna have more than like a half a mile of walking to do anyway. Uh, so I don't need that much. I charge it once a week if I'm using it daily. I, I'll throw in a new battery once a week and I just leave the extra battery at the shop and then I change that sucker out. Here, let's do a quick, uh, a quick swap. We, I don't think we've shown this on camera. So you insert your key right here. We turn it whichever direction, you know, a quarter turn. Sometimes you got to push down to let the latch come open. And then we have these two wires. Here's our BMS system, which talks to, to the controller. And it tells us when to shut the controller down if we have, you know, a low voltage situation. We unplug that guy. We unplug this other connector which is super tight and I unfortunately have to grab it by the wires to do this uh, but so far hasn't been a problem and then we slide her out the instruction booklet tells us to uh, turn off our little contactor in here whenever we unplug the battery I've never done it and I've never even seen a, a spark that would be the one reason to turn off our, our uh, system with this little contactor in there so you don't have sparks but there's not a single spark mark on these so i ain't worried about it uh i'm not going to follow the, the manufacturer's recommendations because you know i'm the type of guy that doesn't do that i avoid warranties i don't read instruction booklets and i love my electric bike so just slide her back in little little pushy do on the controller or on the uh, connector bam heard it seat there's our bms in the formational cables and a little a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and we're ready to go. This is by far my favorite bike in the fleet right now, and uh, yeah, just wanted to share, basically. So, me and my beard will say goodbye for today, but if you do have any more comments, be sure to leave them down below and I will do my best to get to them. And if you want to see more electric bike videos or electric nonsense, just let me know in the comments and I will do my best to try not to hurt myself while having fun. Thanks for tuning in. Have a good one.